You let me know when you're ready, Mr. Technical. Technical difficulty. <laughs> I sent you a message about a headset. Do you have one? Yes, I do. Okay. Although it doesn't sound... Uh, yeah, I hear a little bit of an echo, yeah. Okay, you good? Oh, yes, sir. All right. How are you doing today? Okay, yeah. All right, so everybody say hello to Jeremy Gordon. This is a guy I've never met personally, but um, I'm aware of the great work that you're doing out there in the community and the prestige that you are adding to the Jeet Kune Do world. So it's my pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mr. Gordon. All right, it's nice to meet you too, sir. I watch a lot of your episodes online. <laughs> quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, especially when I have people like Bob Landers on, right? Yes, um, Bob, you have to behave today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so listen, I got a ton of questions for you, but I want to start with this one. Which leg is more flexible, the left or the right? Wow. Because I probably see... My, probably my left, but I kick with my right a lot more. It depends on what technique it is, whatever yeah. moment, whatever legs is forward at the moment. Because I've seen you kicking with both, uh, so I thought, okay, yes. let me find out if one is more, is one stronger and faster? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, I ran hurdles in high school and middle school, so I ran hurdles off my left leg. But everything else I did off my right leg. Ah. So I can do things both legs. Okay. So you've never been out of shape, huh? No, not actually I'm out of shape right now, but um, <laughs> this is the most out of shape I've been. <laughs> this is the most out of shape I've probably right. been in. Yeah. Yes. All right. So schedule. In, in case you people don't understand, right? He's out of shape now, but he can still do two finger push ups. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Right. All right. I got to ask you this other question. I, in one of the pictures of you that I saw, you're getting ready to fly off a wall at two guys. What is up with that? What is the story behind that? Um, you know, me, I've never, normally I shy away from media. <laughs> so this is actually my first probably real interview on JKD. I normally stand by and, and decline interviews. Yeah. Um, well, but I that appreciate day, your spending I, time with me. I do. Um, well, we had to do a photo shoot at a local photo studio and I went there and did some kicks and I kept jumping out of frame and the guy asked me, what can you do? I said, whatever you want me to do. Yeah. He said, can you, run, can you run off a wall? I said, yes. Can you tumble? Yes. He said, let's see. So we met the next day. We met in the morning um, at on Ferris Street, Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, show me something. I said, guys, chase me. <laughs> and he said, what's going to happen? I said, um, I don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> so they chased me and um, I ran at the wall and I ran, jumped on the wall and spent the round. And the photos after that shows me jumping off the wall. I oh, pushed okay. back and jumped back towards the gentleman chasing me. Right. Where did the tumbling come in? When did you start doing that? Well, I've been involved in martial arts my whole life. Um, to tell you the honest truth, I don't know exactly when I started. Some people say three, some people say four. Um, I've always wanted to be like Bruce Lee, like a lot of guys on TV. Yeah. So back in the day, I researched, so Bruce, he can tumble, so I want to tumble. Mm -hmm. He can trap, I can trap. Mm -hmm. He can wrestle, I can wrestle. Mm -hmm. So I just, based on what was in my surroundings, I joined a local tumbling team. I okay. um, also did a basic gymnastics very briefly, okay. just free classes. Really didn't have money to pay for right. great classes, so yeah. I could just pick up from time to time, different locations. Okay. So, so I've been tumbling ever since. All right. So, okay. So, um, so how much of your early training was on your own? How much of it was like in an established uh, martial arts school? Well, my uncle, and I might have to show you some of my images. He was a Midwest martial arts champion. He was a boxing champion, a kickboxing champion back in the early days. Man, so it's in like your blood. Studio. So he did that. And he also wrestled. My other two uncles were also wrestlers and ran track. So I grew up. So they started teaching me from the time I was able to walk from understanding. Mm -hmm. And the first I can remember being in an established school was probably four or five. And it was Shonru Karate. Okay. And then around eight or seven, it became Judo Kwan Taekwondo. And I was taking on both at the same time mm -hmm. before I discovered wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> Did you keep them when you discovered wrestling or you just added the wrestling in? Well... Everything I learned, I kept. One thing I did drop, I dropped all the cards and forms because 
you learn Japanese form, I learn Japanese forms of katas. Mm -hmm. um, then I learned Chinese forms, then Korean forms of martial arts. And I was rehearsing, memorizing 30 or 40 different martial arts types of forms. Yeah. And it didn't do anything to help me become a better kicker or puncher. So I just dropped all that out and I kept the kicking training, the punching training, mm -hmm. footwork. I kept all that. Okay. Um, Kung Fu films. What's your history with them? Um, I used to watch them all growing up. <laughs> Back to the five, the Deadly Venoms and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I left all the Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan. I watched them all. Yeah. I just, it is, when I seen the people do the stuff on the film growing up, I didn't know that they had courts pulling these people in the air, you know, right. as a child. Right. I didn't know they had stuntmen. So whatever I seen them do on film, I try to do in real life. Yeah. Yeah. See, I was going to ask you if, if the, the flying off the wall thing, I was going to ask you if there was wire work involved in that, right? No. Yes. Yeah. But everything that you see, every video footage or image you see of me is, is actually me actually performing it. Yeah. Incredible. So, Incredible. So. Um, so obviously we can't do a dialogue without asking you about the last dragon nickname. <laughs> Right. We got to talk about that. So you got to give me the, the story behind that. Wow. It's been a long time with that one. The <laughs> Last Dragon. People called me that for years. And when I first got called it actually in high school, I did not like it. You know, back in the nineties, martial arts wasn't always great, especially in the inner cities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just martial arts a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So I don't like it. I didn't embrace it. Okay. I kept training year after year, and people say, you look like the last dragon, you look like the guy in the movie. And my friends would make fun of me, like, the guy, the image he's portraying in the movies is your real life. Him going to a studio, trying to train on a master instructor, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Him not using profane language, not cussing, everything he was doing in the movies, watching the Bruce Lee movies, training and working out, is that's what I was doing in real life. Right. So they start calling me last dragon as a joke. And then later on, as I got older, I met Sifu Ted Wong. Actually, we watched The Last Dragon movie. I watched it with him on the couch. <laughs> cool. And then somebody came up to me and was like, so you're the real Last Dragon. Yeah. I was like, uh, I don't know about that, but you know what? I'm going to embrace it. Right. Yeah. Well, I, 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 think it, I think it's very appropriate, man. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know that much about your history, but definitely the, the physical um, resemblance is incredible. I think, you know, but, um, but I think really time Mac wishes he was you. Well, that really, <laughs> I, I've always wanted to meet him. Yeah. We spoke online way Did back you really? in the day, but, but we never, never met face yeah. to face. No. All right. Okay. All right. So now, okay. So answer this question quickly and then we got to go deeper into it. Where did you find the time to learn how to build websites? Well, um, I actually have a degree in industrial technology, concentration in my computer technology. So I study uh -huh. technology. Not, I'm not in up on Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that. Right. But just learning about computers actually relate to martial arts quite well. Yeah. We're using Boolean logic. If one, then not zero. So all that information does play, come into play. Mm -hmm. And I use that and just start playing around websites. Yeah. And, and it's became a knack. Because there's like five of them that I, that, that, that I had yes. to come on, right? And I read all of them, right? I read all of them. And then when I scroll down to the bottom, I go, wait, the website design is by Jay Gordon. I'm like, what the heck? This guy is doing everything. Do everything yourself. If you can do it, why, why get somebody else to do it for yeah. you, right? <laughs> all right. Okay. Self-sufficient. Right. There you go. All right. So... There are three, three things associated with your name. Gordon Tactical. Um, yes. uh, well, actually, there's more than three, but well, let's start with these three. Gordon Tactical, uh, Boxer, Boxer's Rebe Boxer Rebellion, and then Triad Jeet Kune Do. So yes. you got to give me the history behind all of that and break them all down for me. Okay, I'm trying to go fast in this one. No, 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 take well, your when time. I first... <laughs> Um, you have to remember when I started off with martial arts, like I said, I started with Judo Kwan Taekwondo, well, Shoma Kwade, Judo Kwan Taekwondo. I studied on um, pancreation, my uncle, boxing, different forms of kickboxing, American, international. Mm -hmm. And 
wrestling through high school. And when I came to the South, I came to Mississippi from Wisconsin, it didn't exist. Uh, there was not a school. There were Soto County schools and pretty much Taekwondo schools. Mm -hmm. So I started a little group actually at the college I went to. Okay. I uh, started a little training group with a few guys. We were from all over the country. We all trained in different styles of martial arts. Um, and I became like the, one of the lead guys for the group. I didn't want to be called an instructor, right. or sensei, sifu, or nothing. Was, this is a group, a group of guys getting get together working out. Mm -hmm. And I joined the local, one of the local schools. I walked in because I wanted more training for myself. I wasn't growing. Right. I was having fun. Right. And I ended up teaching these guys right. that were black belt in multiple, multiple different system, mm -hmm. systems. But I wasn't growing anymore. So I was trying to find somewhere to go, looking for a master instructor to lead me in the right path, basically. Mm -hmm. And I went to one school and said, excuse me, sir, um, I'm a black belt in martial arts in Taekwondo and in karate. Um, I would like to join your school. I'm willing to start with a white belt. What do I need to do? I'm not sure how this works. Um, and I was kind of scolded at that moment. I said, you're a black belt. Who gave you a black belt? I was like, well, I was a black belt on a multiple. I can give you their credentials. Yeah. He said, well, anybody can train in the backyard with the uncle and claim to be a black belt. Wow. And he said, so are you a rebellious martial artist? And I kind of looked at him. And at that moment, I said, well, I, I, I bowed, respectful. I said, thank you, sir. Yeah. I ended up coming back later and participating in this class. Yeah. And somebody asked me, so you're a rebellious martial artist? I said, no, I'm a rebellious boxer. Because the way you guys train in traditional martial arts, what I was seeing back in the late 90s, didn't resemble my training. Because um, we were already jump roping, using weighted jump ropes, right. push-ups, yeah. jab, cross, slip. So we had conditioning combined with our workouts. Mm -hmm. And this is before MMA blew up. Right. And that's what I was doing back then. And I consider myself more of a boxer than a martial artist, not because of the kicking and punching, but because of the training methods. Okay. Our training resembled more of a boxing versus it did traditional kata, gi, form of martial arts. Right. So I flipped the, that negative and made it to a positive. Instead of calling it you know, nice. rebellious martial artists, yeah. I said, um, welcome to Boxer's Rebellion. Okay. And that's how we came up with it. It was strictly solely based on that. And our group became Boxer's Rebellion for all. And they said, what system are you teaching? I said, I don't have a clue. We were just having fun. Yeah. It's Taekwondo. They said, this is not Taekwondo. Karate. This is not karate. <laughs> And we just kept training and having fun, and we grew from there. Mm -hmm. Hence, we started calling hybrid kickboxing later on. Right. Uh, so you heard hybrid yeah, kickboxing. Yeah, right, yeah. Because I was using so many different systems, and this is before the hybrid cars caught on too. I said, what does hybrid actually mean? It's combining two or more elements and making something more efficient. Yeah. So we were taking all different forms of martial arts. I was still exploring Jeet Kune Do. I didn't have a pure Jeet Kune Do instructor yet. Right. But I was taking what I knew and trying to simplify as much as I could. Yeah, yeah. Instead, I was getting more knowledge, yeah. but I wasn't simplifying at the time. So we started calling it hybrid kickboxing. Okay. Later, as I kept training, I met Ted Wong. <laughs> and when I met Ted Wong, and I'm not going to mention, I actually am certified or went through a lot of people. Actually, a lot of guys you probably interviewed, I probably trained with in the early 90s right. and might have become instructors under some of their systems. So I got respect for what they do. I just don't, I just don't do those methods anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't right for me. Mm -hmm. So when I met Ted Wong, he taught me how to simplify my techniques. Instead of adding more, he wanted me to simplify. Right. He simplified my stance, yeah. simplified my motion, yeah. my breathing, told me when to tighten my, tighten my stomach up, when to relax my stomach when to let my heel slightly drop a little, when it come up, when expand it. And it was small, small stuff that he changed. Mm -hmm. And that small stuff had me make a big, big change. Yes. At that time, I had, a, the I had big, a school. The big things are in the small stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at, um, so I was teaching at a college. I had a job off at a local college running martial arts program. Okay. And when I met Sifu Wong and started training with him, I actually went to a class one day and said, guys, I no longer believe in this method. I shut down my training groups and I stopped teaching publicly for a year. Because um, at that point, instead of teaching a lot of random things, which a lot of people do today, mm -hmm. and they call it MMA, a lot of schools, some schools for MMA actually teach you a method, some just teach you everything. Right. And um, 
and I was trying to find a systematic method to get better. I so see. I shut down all the training locations. I stopped training everybody. I kept three students at the time. I came back a year later, and when I came back a year later, my whole structure had changed. Hence, when Sifu Wong passed away years later, I kept traveling to different seminars. I seen Bob Landers, Rodney Hitchcock, and Bill Matusi, and all these seminars. Year after year after year, we trained together, we had fun, we ate with each other, Sifu Wong, we ate dinner with each other. Mm -hmm. We just had fun. Yeah. I learned a lot more in eating than I did in the actual the training. Yes. The training, I loved it. Yeah. I was on it. Yeah, that's a JKD thing. <laughs> so then, so we came together after Sifu Wong passed away. I said, we want to continue teaching, continue training. And I don't want to be the one where I'm a master on my own or be a Sifu on my own or somebody random on my own mm -hmm. without having somebody that can help keep me accountable for what I do. Mm -hmm. um, as we grow and you train by yourself, over time, you will start making small mistakes that you might not pick up on. If you have another peer that you can go to, um, watch my footwork, watch my right. stance, yeah. watch my punch. Yeah. And they can say, well, you're kind of making mistakes or you're, you're deviating um, a little too much. Mm -hmm. It gives you a chance to reevaluate your training. So we have that core knit where I train in Arkansas, Oklahoma, they train in Jackson, Mississippi, and we travel all over, but we help keep each other accountable um, from boxing, kickboxing, and MMA to whatever. Right. And that's where the triad came at. We work together. Of course, three is found in everything. Yeah. You see all our logos, our threes, yeah. triangles, and circles is a reason yeah. for that. I heard Bob talk about the last interview. Yes. Now, Gordon Tactical came about because I started law enforcement. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, how, yeah. how you, how you went, when, why, and how did you get into that? Well, my thing is, um, with the world, what it was today, me doing martial arts and doing fitness, um, I thought I knew a lot about self-defense. I thought I knew a lot about the world and what police should do and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And seeing the good and the bad in the world, I wanted to do something about it. Okay. And what's the best way to do something about something and be a part of the solution? So I decided either I should go to the military or I should get into law enforcement. Right. I want to make a change. Right. But making a change here at home in the communities that I live in with the people that I see every day was something that I really, really took at heart. I can still teach martial arts. I can still work with my students, but also make a positive impact in the community. Mm -hmm. And that was something else that I was very strong about that a lot of people don't have leadership. You have a lot of martial arts schools, but if you look at it, they go to an area where there's um, people with a lot of money. Right. <laughs> they sit up there and they teach they make money is great, but the ones that need some guidance, that need some character development, that need some positive, po positive social interaction, mm -hmm. when somebody's willing to come into the community, people were shying away from it. Yeah. So I wanted to go to the inner city and go to communities that couldn't reach. Right. Uh, so that's kind of how that went with that. With that, <laughs> and now with the law enforcement, I kept training, became a police officer. Wasn't sure if I was going to stick with it because I found that was a lot different than I thought it was. <laughs> a lot different. In what way? Um, I didn't understand about the rules, regulations, or limitations. Okay. Um, and then I guess I forgot to tell you this, that before I became an officer, when I was teaching, a lot of officers were coming to training with me. And they was, what would you do in this situation? And I said, why would you get in that situation? That's, that's not safe. And I found out they were in corrections or they were detectives. Uh, or something, mm -hmm. and they called me to the side, and I would work with them on the side outside of classes. Then later on, like I said, when I became an officer, so working law enforcement, things changed. Right. And then after I seen the systems and the training, my next goal was to work with the community and somehow get into training to teach people what I've learned and to get better and better every day. Right. Did you start teaching um, like defensive tactics for the department? Uh, right now, I'm one of I am a def one of the defensive tactics instructors for the police department that I work at. Okay, um, I'm one of four people in the state of Mississippi that has a master tactics instructor certification through the boards of standards and training. Okay, um, that's not 
Taekwondo or karate right. or Jeet Kune Do or nothing like that. It's just the tactical training, using OC spray, using your baton, handcuffing. Right. Because you also got to remember the legal ramifications. A lot of people pe teach you how to kick and punch, but don't tell people that you can go to jail for doing so. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So I teach the legal ramifications, the law enforcement, what they can and cannot do. Yeah. But then on the civilian side, I teach them what they can and cannot do with the legal ramifications and based on the totality of the circumstances. So okay. um, I'm a full-time training instructor, and that's what I do full-time. I teach... I transition citizens to law enforcement. What time do you wake up? Um, between 5 and 6 a.m. every day. What time do you go to bed? Between midnight and later. God. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, more power to you, man. <laughs> I, hope you can keep, I hope you can keep up that kind of schedule for a long, long time. Um, yeah. I, I, I knew... Just from reading your websites, just from hearing um, Bob Landers talk about you, I knew I was going to be impressed. Right? I, I, there was, there was, there was no two ways about it. Um, um, Marshall Bowles, who's that guy? <laughs> He's one of my students at the studio. Okay, so he sent me a message, right? <laughs> okay, you got. Listen, here's how I know that you are, the, you are the real deal. That you are the genuine article. You got a bunch of people watching your back all right there's a ton of people who requested to become my friends on facebook just so they could be live with us right and then marshall oh. bowles okay <laughs> marshall bowles sends me a note he says it might be a good idea to touch on these topics right so i said to him i go i think marshall you were looking over my shoulder when i was making my notes this morning almost everything that he suggested I had written down already. So you got, so <laughs> you're a good man. You got good people watching your back, man. And that's what it's about. That's, that's what it's awesome. about. And I'll make sure I let them know that you, um, <laughs> if he's not watching now, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. But I but did want you, call. I did want you to, so I'm going to read back from the website. And then if you could kind of, um, kind of break down and, and explain the, the similarities and, dif and differences. So there's Gordon Fighting Systems for Martial Artists, right? Combative Fitness yes. uh, uh, Students and Athletes. Then there's Gordon Tactical Systems for Coaches, Instructors, and Trainers in Self-Defense and Martial Arts. And then there's Gordon Tactical Systems, again, for Law Enforcement, Military, and Security. So tell me what the differences are and tell me if there are similarities as well. Okay, I'll tell you the differences and similarities. The first thing is Gordon fighting systems and uh, tactical systems exist because of, you know, the great Joe Lewis. Uh, he um, told me when he came to Jackson, Mississippi, when I picked him up from the airport, we we're riding in a car. He said, um, you're just like me. You're a black belt. I'm a black belt. You know, we're the same. Mm -hmm. Your students need to go to you. And he said, what's the system that you're teaching? And I told him what I was teaching. He said, don't call it that. Call it Jeremy Gordon fighting systems. Right. I said, Joe, nobody knows who I am. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it stuck with me. And then seeing the other instructors teach and saying, no, this is my way. It might not, I remember Bill Wallace saying, this is my way. It might not be the right way, but it's my way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and after Joe Lewis passed away, and a few other people have told me to do the same thing. I thought about it. Um, I consider myself um, American here in the United States. Um, instead of teaching different languages, te teaching Japanese, teaching Chinese, teaching Korean and everything else, I wanted to have everything translated to English mm -hmm. because I don't want my students to spend so much time learning how to translate information versus getting information with the current language that they speak. Okay. So with that being said, Gordon fighting systems it has a word fighting in it and that was actually going to be it at first uh -huh. it has a word fighting in it so I teach that to anybody that wants to come off the street to do martial arts training any martial arts training they want to compete in sport training I don't care if it's point fighting right. kickboxing taekwondo karate right. we compete in any kind of tournament that exists just to test our skill set I don't care if it's a grappling tournament Brazilian Jiu Jitsu we work with judo, whatever it is, we're going to compete and have fun with it. <laughs> so fighting systems is basically based sport-based. 
and it has a little self-defense in there also, but it's more sport-based, more conditioning-based for the general person off the street. Okay. Most people that come to me do not want to become a professional fighter, and they're not looking to really, really learn real, real self-defense, mm -hmm. real tactical self-defense. You can't learn that in a day or a couple. You need actual time and training. So that's how Gordon Fight Systems became to be. Ah. Now, Gordon Tactical Systems came to be because of when you're teaching law enforcement, I can't teach law enforcement officers how to fight. Right. Yes, that makes I sense. I can't teach them a martial arts system. I have to teach them how to use tactics and what they're doing. Um, using the word fighting is not... Uh, yeah. Was, it's not going to hold up for I like that. You in, that, in that profession. That's attention so to that, detail right there, man. So the word fighting couldn't exist. Yeah. I can't use the word Jeet Kune Do because Jeet Kune Do is Bruce Lee's martial arts, the way of the intercepting fists. And if you really study Jeet Kune Do and teach people pure Jeet Kune Do concepts, is a very offensive art. And if I went to talk a class, this is Jeet Kune Do I'm teaching you for your defensive tactics system. I'm teaching officers how to hurt people, <laughs> which is not yeah. what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I couldn't use, so I had to come up, what can I do? What does the law require me to do on a national level uh, and also within a state level and enter a small departments or agencies? What can I do? Mm -hmm. So I took everything I learned from tactical training, everything I learned about use of force law, everything we learned about mechanics of arrest, took the science, some legal research, uh, court cases, Supreme Court, researched it all and broke it down to a simplified component of teaching modern tactics, right? but using the adaptability, simplicity, so you, economy, so, emotion. Right. So you were using Jeet Kune Do principles, even if not the Jeet Kune Do fighting approach. Yes. Jeet Kune Do, the principles of JKD is ingrained in everything I do. Okay. So with that being said, uh, once I had that as a clear core of what I was doing, yeah. I took it and had to make sure it translated. If we do this technique, is it acceptable in a court of law? Okay. Is it acceptable legally, you know, in a court? Is it acceptable if somebody, we strike somebody or somebody gets hit a certain way? Not just that. What type of injury will it happen? What would it affect if you hit somebody this way to this part of the body using this particular personal weapon? I had to break that down and break it down a way that I can teach this standing at a podium with a PowerPoint or through a manual, then teach people 40 to 80 hours on how to perform these techniques adequate. Mm -hmm. And then I have different levels. I just don't have the levels online. Okay. Okay. So that's how it came to be. It came to be a necessity um, for legal reasons. And also I need to keep the people I teach safe. Right. And that's the one I got to keep the, that population actually safe. What about the fitness element when you teach law enforcement? <laughs> How, how in shape are these guys? If they're training in an academy, they're getting um, very great fitness. Okay. Um, um, I doubt there's, um, very, there's very few um, schools of martial arts doing the type of training they're doing. Okay. <laughs> um, I, they're not used to, I mean, any given day, get up, run, you know, three miles plus, do their agility runs, they push ups, right. squat thrusts, burpees, yeah. side sort of hop, jumping jacks, do all that type of training. But on the fitness that I'm doing, with the tactical fitness is going to be a little bit different than that type of fitness. Okay. Because I rework on that actually as we speak. Oh, yeah? It's taken, it's taken all the fit fitness methods that I use for law enforcement and firefighters and those type of units. What kind of things do they need to do? Right. They need to be able to pick somebody up over their shoulder and carry people. Right. They also need to be able to drag people. Yeah. They also need to be able to um, use, their use, use their use of force methods, be able to grapple, right? run short distances. They need to be able to run long distances, they need to go through obstacles. So it's a, it's a little bit different because the fitness is not based on, it's not the hypertrophy method like bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to make you look a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also not using the same method that powerlifters use for pure, pure power. We can't use the pure aerobic method either because of, you need some kind of muscular endurance. Because mm -hmm. uh, a true fight, you know, shall last seconds, not minutes, right? Right. right. Um, a sport fight, you have to train a little bit different. Yeah. So the condition for sport athletes is different because we do it based on the Tabata method or different round training versus tactical training, 
you got to have burst of energy, you have muscular endurance to hold on to it, and your aerobic and anaerobic needs to be there to um, help you out in that capacity. Right. Okay, so when you talked about college, you didn't talk about studying all of this. Where did this knowledge come from? I read a lot. <laughs> but you don't, sleep, you don't sleep, obviously, right? Well, I sleep, but me, I'm very, you know how people read novels? Mm -hmm. um, I don't read novels. I read books for information. Right. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, how people go to watch football games. Yeah. I don't watch football games. I don't watch basketball games. Yeah. I, um, they're fun. I'll play it for fun. But I, I'd rather spend my time reading or um, creating. Yeah. Websites. <laughs> <laughs> websites, logos, yeah. uh, whatever, you, whatever you need. Yeah. <laughs> I know on one of the websites, um, you, you reprinted um, the three stages of cultivation. Yes. Right, and I wanted to ask you why. Um, what what's what's so impactful about the three stages of, of cultivation that it warranted space on on a page on your website? <clears throat> well, I think a lot of people when they come to train the martial arts, they expect, especially on the the JKD crowd and the MMA crowd, they're pretty much almost the same. I'm be honest with you. Okay. That's why I stay away from interviews because I try not to be controversial. I'll stay in my little corner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but most people come, they have no sense of what martial arts is. Hmm. When I tell people I do martial arts, they say you do karate. Right. I said, no. Um, do Taekwondo? No. Right. I do martial arts. It's better to tell me, what do you want to learn? Yeah. And I can tell you, I can help you. Yeah. Um, so people come to the studio over and over again, and I have a lot of people ask me, how long will it take me to get really good? And I just sit them down to say, first, you need to come here to understand what you're learning. Yeah. It's going to take a time period for you to understand our training approach. The way we think, our strategy, I can't give it to you in a day. Need, you also need to understand our biomotor abilities, how we move our body, how the body functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you need to learn how to have that mind and that body and your spirit come together with that technique. Once you get that down, now you can start applying strategy. Right. And so that's how I broke it and start breaking it down to people. Then you start learning the strategy of how we apply what you've learned. Okay. Everything we have is tools. So like, uh, for instance, uh, um, a carpenter, they don't take a screw and take a hammer and use a hammer to put a screw in a wall. They use a screwdriver or something of that nature, right? Right. Same thing with a nail. You can use a, a wrench. You can use a shoe to put a nail in the wall, <laughs> but you're not using a proper tool. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it won't work in that situation. And it takes a lot of time to explain. So I walk through people, their first day, I walk through a lot of what we are and what we are not. Mm -hmm. So they have an informed decision if they want to train with us or not. Okay. I'd rather somebody come with us and love to be here right. versus, the, versus coming. Right. And this is not what I was looking for. Yeah. A lot of people expect to see a gi with a belt. Yeah. Well, how many, what kind of I got to do next? Yeah. What I got to do next for my next rank? I said, when you're ready for the next rank, I will let you know. You know it's a, fun, it's a funny thing. Uh, so so I, I teased Marshall Bowles about looking over my shoulder when I was going to Miami Beach this morning. And, but on Miami Beach with my, with, with my good friend, Anthony Fontana, we had the same conversation this morning. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is very hard um, because of, uh, people go for what's popular at the moment. Yes. Um, I could put a logo outside my building and say, this is Jeet Kune Do, right. Bruce Lee's martial art. Yeah. And this is the place to come and get it. I trained with Joe Lewis, I trained with Ted Wong, and the, the floodgates may open. Mm -hmm. But I purposely don't do that. Yeah. We're a boxer, Shabane is an organization. What we teach for most of our classes is hybrid kickboxing. Hybrid kickboxing is what I know about JKD plus everything else I know okay I don't want to, I don't want to discredit Bruce Lee by guessing where I think Bruce Lee would have went mm -hmm. I can't guess what I think he would have done or what he would have excluded or ex discarded or added mm -hmm. all I know is that around the age of 18 Bruce Lee started making changes 
He came to America. He taught martial arts. He taught what he knew. And as he grew, he, he created a system of Jun Fan Gung Fu. At some point, he decided that that wasn't good enough for him. That he created Jeet Kune Do, yeah. which is a little bit different. His knowledge changed. His structure changed. And, but I don't know what progression he would have made. So I can't add things to Bruce Lee's martial art. And actually, when Ted Wong taught at a lot of seminars, he would say that. He would say, well, I teach Bruce Lee's martial arts. Then he would look around in the crowd and sometimes see new people. Uh, then he would say, Jeet Kune Do. Right. So I look at Jeet Kune Do as still, it's still Bruce Lee's martial arts. I want to honor it to the best I can. But if I want to add elbow strikes, if I want to add judo throws, if I'm working on um, stunning techniques, striking the brachial plexus origin, uh, striking the radial motor nerves and different things of that nature, I'm using infraorbital doing touch pressure points. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Brucey would have did that. Okay. And I can't say what Brucey would have done. I right. speculate where he would have went. Right. So I'll keep evolving JKD based on the structure that I was given from, from Ted Long. Sifu Wong. Yeah. And what I learned from Joe Lewis, because believe it or not, they had a lot of things more alike than different. Yeah. Did, a lot of people didn't spend enough time with them to see the difference. Did you start with Joe Lewis after Ted Wong or before? Well, actually, um, I knew who Joe Lewis was first. Uh -huh. I followed Joe Lewis. I became a member, I think, of uh, the Joe Lewis Fighting System. Right. I had his information, his books. I followed him. Yeah. I um, started training with Ted Wong first. Okay. But I had Joe Lewis's DVDs, I had books, I had things from Joe Lewis mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I just wasn't actually training with him. Hey, did, Joe, <laughs> did, did Bill Wallace want to, want to call you Lil Superfoot? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, it was fun training with him. It was, it, was, it was, I love training with Bill Wallace. He's a character. Oh, oh my God, he's a oh, character. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Last time I trained with him, he... Um, I was supposed to take my black belt test for the Superfoot system, not the not the Taekwondo that he signs off for black belt also. Okay. Uh, he's on a board for Taekwondo too. Okay. Um, but I still remember I was in a car accident prior to that. I just got released from the doctor. Wow. I was about two months out, and I said, I'm good to go. I had ligament tear, ligament tear in my knee. Oh, man. Ligament tear. Sorry to hear that. Uh, in, my sh in my shoulder, and I was ready to test. He said, no, you can't test. I said, I'm ready, I'm ready. He said, no, you can't <laughs> test. You just really, I said, I'm released from the doctor. <laughs> and uh, so they did, uh, they had uh, their black belts come and take their photos. And he said, come on over here, come take the photo with us. So I trained with them, but the day I was supposed to take the test, uh, couldn't test. And then after that, I got moved around in my day job. So uh -huh. my law enforcement capacity, yeah. where I don't have the flexibility to travel as much as I used to. Okay. So it's kind of hard for me to make the, make the seminars like I used to. The um, the Cobra stuff that you that you're involved with also is that out of the Joe Lewis system? Yes, Chris uh, Chris Sutton is a student was a student of Joe Lewis, okay. and he's out of um, Florida. Okay. And actually, I met him through Joe Lewis. Okay. And I seen what he taught there, and I was looking for something different to teach outside of what I was teaching. I was trying to separate everything. All right. So, Cobra system, I do it by request. Okay. It's my request to Cobra system. I do a Cobra workshop for them. Got it. But typically, I just go in and what do you, what do you want? I'll do a personal safety workshop. Then I do a crime prevention. After I do that, then I go on to okay. Now it's going hands on physical application. Okay. So yeah, different audiences, of course. Yeah. Um, the uh, the so so I don't know if this is a typo on the website or not, but here's what I noticed. So um, there's an asterisk next to everything that is available to the public. I take a note of this. Go ahead. Okay. So, GTS edged weapons is available to the public, but GTS impact weapons doesn't have an asterisk. Is that a typo or is there a specific reason for that? Um, no, the method that I teach, I'm using the impact weapons that I'm using. Um, they're um, law enforcement issued. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I don't, if, you, if you're not issued that, I don't teach it to you. Oh, unless, okay. Unless you work for um, a security company. Right. So you can prove who you are. Yeah. And then I can actually train you. But certain things, uh, I just don't teach everybody everything. Okay. Bob, Bob Landers said to me, he goes, okay, so Dwight, don't worry. He's got the weapon side down also. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, um, he, he said something about that. I, I stay out of this a lot. <laughs> Um, but I do, I do work with them. I do research different forms of martial arts. So yeah. I do practice, um, I do some of the old school, traditional knife fighting, knife techniques mm -hmm. and baton techniques. And I do research even the Filipino martial arts, but I don't need a system. Right. I'm teaching people to survive. Right. Not, not to carry on a lineage within that. Right. So I'm not trying to in, incorporate a whole new system. My thing is, what is the best way to use this device in my hand to defend myself or defend someone else. Mm -hmm. What's the best way? What's the easiest way to do it? Mm -hmm. Like, like I said, we're trying to keep everything simple. Right. So when I train, that's what I have in mind. How can I make the, anybody that takes this class, they need to learn how to use this to defend themselves. It could be a life or death situation. Right. It, not, doing it fun, yeah. fancy stuff. That's great. Yeah. And I do work on some of that stuff. So my guys, we do it every once in a while for fun. And so I have people, guest instructors come in. I allow anybody from any system of martial arts to come in to teach a class or work with us because mm -hmm. I can learn. Right. But, <clears throat> but when I study weapons, I look at modern weapons here in this country. Um, you have a lot of open carry states. Mm -hmm. So the weapon of choice primarily is a gun. You gotta be honest with yourself. Um, a lot of people carry guns, and um, unlike the last dragon, I cannot catch bullets with my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so right. we try to teach people how to be safe and try to avoid. First of all, to avoid situations. Right. Avoid everything as possible. But if your job is to be there to be to try to stop the threat or whatever you need to do, mm -hmm. you have to figure out what's the best way to defend myself or defend someone in a situation. If I'm that close to the person and I can't do anything else, what do I need to do? Yeah. So that's a weapon systems. I talk about you got impact weapons, then you have knives, then you have um, uh, your personal weapons, which is the human body. Mm -hmm. And personal weapons, you have strikes, you have grappling, standing in ground, touch application where it has lots, pressure points. Um, am I missing it? OC spray. I wanted to ask you, yeah. Phrase. Okay, so the, the saber mm -hmm. red is that is that what is that what you're talking about? Yes, that's one of the systems I teach. Yes. Right. Okay. So, if somebody, besides actually taking a self defense course, right? Why are you laughing? I got you covered. Go ahead. <laughs> right. So, besides taking yes. like the Cobra course or something, what would be your recommendation for someone who wants to carry protection, but it's but but let's say they can't carry law enforcement uh, stuff, right? What's your recommendation for, for carrying protection? Well, I tell people the very first thing is you need to understand wherever you live at. I know a lot of people from different countries. You need to understand what are the rules and regulations for your country. Right. Do they even allow you to use that item? Right. Um, in the States, are you allowed to have that, whatever state you're from? Every state has different laws. Mm -hmm. Then find out your county, your city. Can I carry this in this county or city? Mm -hmm. And uh, then I would say the next thing is find somebody that is certified and authorized to teach. In practice, using different methods first. Find out what works best for you. Then if you need to go purchase, you probably purchase it. Uh, a lot of people go purchase things or a lot of, uh, for instance, um, guys might buy their girlfriend's OC spray. Right. Uh, or they buy it and they could use it, but they have it. They never used it before. Mm -hmm. They've never opened a cat before. They don't know if they got a stream, if they got gel, if they got foam. They don't have any idea. And a lot of stuff has expiration dates on it, too. Right. Yeah. So get training on whatever you're going to carry. Then after you get your training, ask that instructor because there are different methods. I teach a lot of different methods because I teach my thing, but when I'm operating under somebody else's banner, I have to teach what they require me to teach. Right, yeah. I mean, if somebody asks me to teach OC, I'll say, which method do you want? I have to teach the method they request. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, um, I, I got <laughs> to be honest with you. I saw the Sabre Red thing. I was like, what the heck is that? I had to look it up. I didn't know what that was. You know, <laughs> it's, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
All right. They, the slogan has been, make, been making it, what, Grown Man Cry since 1975, I think it's uh, the That's pretty good. Uh, all right, you mentioned fun. What do you do for fun? Read, work out, <laughs> watch Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. have, you, have you done any stunt or movie work? I couldn't find, I, I tried to research that. I couldn't find anything. Well, I haven't did any of, uh, I guess, real stunt work, but I've worked with guys that have done stunt work. Okay. Guys have come to the studio, and for instance, there's a studio in Georgia, Atlanta, yeah. have come to here, and I did workshops on how to fall, right. or if you kick this angle, what do you need to do? Right. And they go off and get parts of movies, stuntmen and everything else. I know it, I never hear anything else about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've did a few scenes for independent films in the past where they asked me to come in, have somebody throw me because I know how to fall, mm -hmm. stuff like that, push me. Mm -hmm. And I've done it for years, and I still do it with other instructors. A judo instructor may call me in and throw me. A hot keto instructor may want me to do something with them or Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Jeet Kune you have to be able to adapt yeah. to whatever. Yeah. Uh, but the, la the only film I seen Mr. Landers post this earlier um, I was on the James Brown movie. They cut most of the scenes I was in, <laughs> but uh, but I'm the cameraman. Yeah. So okay. when you have uh, Chadwick Boseman, you know that the Black Panther. Well, I was going to ask right? you if somebody from Black Panther production gets in touch with you, you're going to go, right? Yes, I would request vacation, and I would be um, on the next flight or okay. the road. <laughs> so if you know anybody, <laughs> send my way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but. During the movie, the James Brown, I went there. I didn't even know about the auditions. I showed up. It was fun. Mm -hmm. And I played around backstage. Um, that's what my, my casting calls the backstage guy. And I was back there dancing like James Brown. We was all playing around, having fun. Yeah. I like dancing, too. Nice. And um, the guy came back there and said, how come you didn't audition for a part? You, could dance, you can do these dances. I'm like, <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> um, so he called us out, and um, Chadwick Boseman was out there with Viola Davis. Uh, when she came in the room, uh, and Danny Ackroyd was in the room. I was in there, and they made everybody get out the room. And that's when I came up. And he takes a picture. And he said, I have a great day or something like that. And I said, well, thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, that's me with a little camera, 1950s camera taking the picture. Okay. You can barely see me. And then at the party scene with Danny Ackroyd, I'm in that scene, right. too. You, my friends, see, they spotted me. They see me. I see the back of your head. Oh, I see the side of your face. I'm like, there's no point even mentioning it to anybody. Right. Oh, man. But it was, it was fun, you know. It yeah. was fun. Yeah, that stuff is always fun. Um, I want to ask you something specific about Jeet Kune Do. Is there, is there anything that, that it amazes you still to this day that people don't understand about Jeet Kune Do that they just don't get? Um, right now, I get kind of frustrated, um, and I do see it. I just don't comment mm -hmm. uh, because, of, you know, with the – modern um internet warriors out there i kind of uh i don't have the time yeah to to battle them yeah and i don't believe in degrading anybody or spreading negativity by anybody it's yeah. not because if i do that with somebody else it's gonna be on me be on my chest and my heart mm -hmm. so with that being said jeet kune do is bruce Lee's martial arts it's his system um when you teach jeet kune do you're representing bruce lee and maybe the person that taught you, like a Ted Wong or right. Joe Wilson, in my case. Right. And people don't understand that there are times in your life you make changes. Like I said, I started off with Taekwondo, karate, and wrestling, did a little boxing, just pancreas, just had fun. My knowledge from childbirth to 18, at 18, I was probably very tough, very fast, in great shape. But my structure is nothing to how my structure was when I was 25. Right. And then it's nothing how it was when I was 35. So with that being said, Bruce Lee made transitions and people get confused when they look at Bruce Lee he did was his teenager. This is Jeet Kune Do because Bruce Lee did this when he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. 90% of stuff I did when I was a teenager, I don't use. Right. I did it because that's what I was taught. Yeah. But it's not relevant to my training now. It's too slow. And if you have time to trap, you have time to, to hit. hit. Yeah. So I do trapping. 
and I, I do trap and drills for fun. But I, I tell people the entering trap is the most important part of trapping in my opinion. Because that's when the initial strike is coming. That means you did not intercept the person's attack. But you know about interception. You didn't intercept it because now you're trapping. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't intercept, so you didn't strike first, you didn't hit back. Right. <laughs> you trapped and stop. And so I get kind of um, confused. Some people, they want to, they'll practice three traps yeah. prior to striking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have even seen people call in trapping intercepting, and I'm like, I don't think that's intercepting. No. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. I don't think so. Uh huh. Um, Joe Lewis seminars did were, were they? How were they different? You said that they were very similar to Ted Wong seminars. Yes. In 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 what elements? Joe Lewis was a, was a um, sticker on mechanics. Uh -huh. He's about the science. Okay. I still remember when I, um, uh, me and Joe Lewis sat in the hotel and talked. I remember he'd, go, he'd grab um, your hand, shake your hand, look at your forearm, look at your forearm strength. Um, he had me hit his gripping devices, and he had me um, trying to see, I guess, my tensile strength was, see how, how much I can grip and, and squeeze. Yeah. And he had, um, I didn't know he traveled with these, but he had these things with different tensile strength, different levels. And um, he's always about body mechanics. Um, I remember the first time they see my footwork, see me in my stance. Yeah, but my stance is very narrow. But when we start doing drills and start using a footwork and striking, right? I said, who taught you? <laughs> well, they said, who taught you? And I said, uh, then I said, well, I learned my whole life all over the place. Uh -huh. um, I have multiple instructors, but my last instructor was um, was Ted Wong. Yeah, you know, because um, my stance was narrow, but it widens as I get closer. It transitions as my tactics transition. Yeah. Everything you do in JKD should be in a transitional floating frame. Mm -hmm. Like I said, not having fixed patterns, but the whole thing is everything should be transitional. Yeah. Every movement should be transitional from one movement to the next. There's no stopping. There's no ending. All you do is completing the movement through striking. Right. So the seminars are very similar because um, Joe Lewis focused on footwork a whole lot. Okay. Footwork was a uh, key. You got to move your feet. Yeah. He also talked about the angles of attack. Yeah. Um, so I was like, Joe Lewis my angles attack, Ted Wong my angles. Um, Joe, <coughs> Joe Lewis talked about footwork, Ted Wong talked about footwork. Yeah. They both talked about the jab or the lead side, Joe Lewis did. Joe Lewis didn't care if you had your left or right side forward later on. Yeah. Um, back in the day, we trained Bruce Lee, I believe he had his dominant side forward, but he changed it. Okay. So they're very similar in, in that respect. Um, and then you had a lot of people, and the seminars we had, you had a lot of martial arts that came in. Joe Lewis, you had, actually had fighters, amateur and professional fighters, right. boxers, kickboxers coming. Right. And the seminars that we had with Ted Wong, the guys um, were martial artists from all different systems, from what, Kaido Kempo mm -hmm. to um, Taekwondo, karate, boxing, kickboxing, MMA, Muay Thai, or whatever. And we're working together. It wasn't just, we do Jeet Kune Do. It was a Jeet Kune Do group. But there's a lot of other people that came in to get educated on these different methods mm -hmm. and how they can improve their martial arts and improve their performance. Uh, okay. And so I think a key element that's missing a lot of people's training is training your, your physical body to perform the movements you need to do. That's you have to train your intrinsic muscles. Right. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so so I did, I'm I'm gonna get the the signal that my phone's uh -oh. run. No, 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 no. We got we we got time, <laughs> right? But I know it's gonna happen anytime soon. Um, okay. Your value system, where'd that come from? Your your personal and moral value system, where'd that come from? I would say from my upbringing with my family, and I guess also starting martial arts at a very early age. Okay. Okay. Uh, martial arts back in the day, we weren't allowed to smile. You know that. <laughs> uh, we weren't allowed to smile. We weren't allowed, allowed to look left or right. We had to stand at attention until we were given orders to move. Right. And if you move, you didn't say yes sir, no sir, yeah. you were penalized for it. Yeah. So I got very disciplined at a very early age. Yeah. Um, then my family was always involved in physical fitness and always motivating, watching Mike Tyson fights. Watch later on Roy Jones fights. Yeah. Watch Muhammad Ali. Yeah. And then of course Bruce Lee. So yeah. with 
it, so that's where I came from. Your mom and dad still around? Yes. Yeah, they proud of you? Yeah, I believe so. They, well, they should be. <laughs> uh, take it from me. They, they should be. Um, because, I, okay, so I got, I got uh, two more things that I want to ask you about. Um, how did helping the youth and looking out for the community become important to you? You see a lot of things going on in society. It's one thing to get on stage and do a fancy kick and fly through the air and do a demonstration. You know, a lot of which hands. you've done. I've seen a lot of you flying yes. through the air. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I tell people, I can fly if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when you go to the, um, my first, I work at the Boys and Girls Club closely. Okay. When you go to the Boys and Girls Club, you talk to this youth that uh, may not have any other chance to take a martial arts program. They're not exposed to it. They can't afford to pay $150 a month here. They can't afford to pay the rates over here. Mm -hmm. So giving back to them and seeing them look up to you, and then you see them four or five years later mm -hmm. graduating from, um, from high school, getting out of middle school, or you see somebody that, that's having troubles at home. Maybe yeah. they don't have a, st a stable home environment. Right. And then you steer them to the right path where they graduate from high school. They get them good jobs. They go to college. And sometimes people's families are not there for them. And if their family's not there for them, if I can be there, I'll try my best to be there. And I spare myself thin a lot. <laughs> but <coughs> you, martial arts is far beyond kicking and punching. Right. If you're only in for martial arts for kicking and punching, that's, that's great for you. But it's not doing anything for you on the inside. It's not teaching you how to give back to the community is you don't have any spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. Something's missing from the equation. Well said. Well said. All right, let's, let's, let's finish with this one. How do you feel about the public's perception of law enforcement versus the reality of law enforcement? Well, it depends. Um, like I said, um, a law enforcement agency should resemble the population they're serving. Okay. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's a given. Okay. Um, but public perception, um, I think, will always be a little bit negative because the basis of law enforcement, you can't tell everything that you're doing. We can't tell everybody if we're going to do certain things because we are looking for people. <laughs> 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 so uh, public perception, um, I believe it could change if law enforcement has a great relationship with the public, right. communicate with the public, right. and let them know certain things they can let them know by having a relationship. Yeah. That your children go to the same school, sometimes they're bad. <laughs> the suspect's children go to school. Right. <laughs> you may go to the same churches, yeah. hang out the same place, <laughs> shop at the same place. Yeah. So when they understand you're a human being, but it's up to the officer to get out there to get to know the public but it's also up to the public to take time to get to know the officer yeah um, and there is a lot of divide right now in the country and um, i'm not sure how to correct that problem um, i'm not in a position to do anything about it other than my part right where going to the boys and girls club going to battered women's shelters speaking to people that's involved in crime yeah um, helping children that's going through bullying in schools is just giving them some type of confidence, some kind of hope to do something greater. Yeah. I tell people when I do the two finger push up, it was an accomplishment for me because I see a lot of it online now, but other than Bruce Lee, I was the only YouTube footage that was doing a two finger push up when I started doing it. Mm -hmm. I did it because I was told that nobody can do it but Bruce Lee. Right. And I said, he was a human being. Right. So I kept training. I accomplished it. Okay, set another goal. Right. This was a goal done. Let me set another goal. Yeah. So we have to try to find a way to set goals. Yeah. Positive goals. Okay. So. All right. I'm going to make a recommendation to you. Since you since you built like seven websites, I know you can write. You got to take all this stuff and put it in a book, man. I'm about to work on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need your help with that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I hey, need your help with that. Hey, anything, anything, anything I can do, I, I'm, I'm there for you, man. It, it, it was, it was a real pleasure getting to know you. I, I, like you said, you don't do a whole lot of interviews. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart that you took the time to spend with, with us here this evening. I, I, I really enjoyed it. It's good to know, get, good to get to know you. Uh, it's nice to talk to you too, sir. And um, hopefully, I did a great job since this would be my first public interview on any of these. <laughs> hey, if anybody <laughs> wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to to to, to reach out to you? <laughs> the best way would be either to go to the website okay. or email me at Jeremy. That's J E R E M Y at boxersrebellion dot com. All right. That's B O X E R S E R E B E L L I O N dot com. All right. Okay. All right. Jeremy Gordon, it was a pleasure, man. You take care, all right? All right. Thank you, Okay. Sir. All right. All right. So, if anybody ever doubted that we don't have, like, the greatest people in the Jeet Kune Do clan, now you know, all right? Okay. That was episode number 93. What a cool guy, huh? Uh, he is awesome. Uh, episode 93 with Jeremy Gordon. Uh, check him out. He said, uh, Jeremy at boxersrebellion.com. Uh, that's it for today. So you guys know the deal free, uh, feel free to share, like comment, ask questions. If you want, uh, I'll invite him to go over anything that, uh, needs answering from him, uh, sign up for notifications for when we, uh, go live here on Facebook and also s subscribe over on the YouTube for when we put up the final edit video. Uh, for the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast, the Jeet Kune Do dialogues, and the FMA files. Follow me on Twitter at Dwight Woods and on Instagram at Dwight D. Woods. Um, like I said in the beginning, uh, next Friday we will have an episode, but I, I don't have either of the two uh, prospective uh, dialogue partners confirmed, but we will definitely be back here at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, next Friday. All right, that's it. I'll see you uh, next time around. You guys have a great weekend. This is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, signing off. Take care now.